Welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, and my co-host is Janet Corsi. The topic of today's show is knowing your strengths in writing. Our guests for today's show are Jared D. Marie... Mary, pretty close. <laughs> say it again. Say it again. Gerard de Marigny or garage de Marigny. or garage de Marigny. <laughs> That's where my electric bills go to. <laughs> and Gregory A. Compass. Compass. Yeah. All right, I got that one. All right. <laughs> well, I should know that one by now. Right. Uh, before we get to our guests, my panel and I would like to read a few fun jokes and quips. Or I'm gonna let Jan start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heaven. I, and I'll tell you what, I love this because it's so true. You know you're a writer when you read and reread your favorite authors, hoping they'll rub off on you in a non-obvious way. And that, when we're all dead and chilling up in literary heaven, we'll be like, ow, I see what you did there. And then we'll all laugh and share a smoke because tobacco is cool in literary heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Gregory... Um, you know you're a writer when no one wants to watch TV with you because you're constantly deconstructing character motives and predicting the endings correctly, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> and Gerard. I say you know you're a writer when you devise backstories for every single person that's in front of you in the checkout line at a grocery store, uh-huh. <laughs> including uh-huh. the cashier. Yeah. I have any, I've, done, I've done something similar to that. I've always wondered, I wonder what their story I is. I wonder what their story it. is. I know. Huh? Uh, you know you're a writer when you con- you're constantly broke, like constantly. <laughs> yeah, that's us. Uh, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, along with my co-host, Janet Corsi, and our guests are Gerard D. Marigny. And <laughs> I said it wrong again. Good night. Mary, okay, Mr. Mary James me. Keely. Mary, Mary, Mary. <laughs> Sorry? Marini. 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 And Gregory Compass. The topic of today's show is knowing your strengths in writing. Our first <laughs> guest is, <laughs> is, <laughs> is Gerard de Marini. Don't look away from your screen. All right. <laughs> uh, Mr. de Marini is an American novelist and screen, screenplay writer. He has just completed co-writing the re- reboot of Grizzly Adams' TV series, oh, cool. Grizzly Adams' The Gold Rush Years, with his writing and producing partner, Michael Greenberg and Todd Swindell. I got theirs right. You got him. Uh, now in development with CMT Network. <clears throat> Network. In 2017... Gerard <laughs> also co-wrote two feature films with Greenberg, Aperture, uh, the Dorothea Lange story, a biopic focusing on the classic works by the famed photojournalist, and Black Ice, the epic and virtually unknown tale of fabled uh, champions of the Colored Hockey League. I never heard of that. I'd never heard of that either. Me neither. Yeah. That's very Recently, cool. Mr. Demar- <laughs> Demarini... Marini was brought on board as a, nar- a narr- narration writer for a new reality uh, series created and produced by Greenberg and Chad Denning in development also on the CMT. In September 2017, Damarini became a co-writer for the feature film Leonardo. Uh, he originally and was originally written by Greenberg. Uh, in November 2016, Damarini and Greenberg completed the screenplay Chris De Niro. Chris De Niro. Okay, got that one. And The Watchmen of Ephraim. Oh, my God. <laughs> now in development with legendary in- entertainment. Based on Demarini's first novel, The Watchman of Ephraim, Ephraim, I'm sorry, Chris De Niro, book one. So you've written a series of those books. Yes. Okay. And he's also begun the sequel to Chris De Niro, uh, Signs of War, based on the second novel in the C&D series. As a novelist, Demarini has currently begun work on White Widow, uh, Archangel, Mission Logs 3. And what is that one? That's uh, that's the novella, and that's the sequel to New Detroit, the new book, the new novel out by uh, Chris De Niro. Okay, and that's really going to be released in sep- well, it's released this month. Uh, uh, well, White Widow, uh, New Detroit, New Detroit was re- released this month, and White Widow should be out by the end of the year. Oh, okay, and since 2011, um, and let's see, your inaugural publication publication of The Watchmen of Ephraim, Chris De Niro, Book One, uh, Mr. Demarini has independently published six Chris De Niro novels and two Archangel no- novellas. These literary works are set in the days and years following September 11, 2001, when a non-governmental based counter-terrorist firm is formed to respond to crisis born from a variety of modern geopolitical events. That sounds really deep. It's, 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 wow. uh, it's pretty cool. All right, so what have I left out? 
Right, there's, I'm sorry I put you through that. <laughs> but uh, uh, probably the new Chris De Niro, if anybody's interested, is going to be published because I took three years working on the TV and movies, the Hollywood stuff. Uh, I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, so there will be a new novel out in the spring. That will be the next Chris De Niro. Okay. And, well, obviously 2011 was the inspiration for you know, the one series. Um, how did you become a writer? What, what inspired you to become a novelist? Uh, well, I was always writing. I was uh, a musician, a uh, professional musician, and musicians have a lot of downtime. So when you're on the, on the road um, while other people sleep, I was writing. But I didn't know that you could publish and monetize and make it out of, a living out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the 80s, uh, big Conan Doyle fan. I thought I, can read, uh, I could write the uh, unwritten works from Conan Doyle. So I wrote to the Conan Doyle estate and said, hey, I can uh, f- write those stories for you. And they wrote <laughs> back to me. Who are you? So <laughs> that didn't work out too well. I also did the same thing probably about five years later. Uh, I was working with Dennis McCarthy, uh, the guy that did music for uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and um, I thought I could write the Star Trek novels. I'm a, I'm a big Star Trek head. I read the novels. Okay. And uh, I, so I contacted Paramount. I don't know why, but um, <laughs> they kind of gave me the same thing. Who are you? What have you written? So I was like, you know what? It's kind of a vicious circle. If you haven't written anything, you can't get a job writing because everybody wants to know, what did you write? Right. And so right. I said, I'm going to have to do this myself. And that's, that's, that's where it led to. In 2001, uh, 9-11, I lost 14 friends. My wife and I lost oh, in, the, wow. in the North Tower. And I think out of survivor's guilt, I, w- I, wrote a, uh, I wrote the manuscript. I wrote the story of Watchmen of Ephraim, which is a story about a man who loses his wife and unborn child in the North Tower. And... Um, I decided to publish it, and that's, that was how I end up at your desk here. So I'm just curious, how did you get that out there? You know, how did you get, garner attention to it? Uh, I had written a Christian Spec uh, uh, novel uh, before that, a manuscript, and I chopped it the normal way, back which you would do in uh, 2009, this was. So I sent it to New York, and after 74 rejections... Uh-huh. Uh, that's I, all? Yeah, <laughs> that was enough. Uh, I, I just said, okay, this is not making sense. Uh, there, I came from the music business, and an agent is somebody who represents you and gets you business. And, and what happens is it, this whole paradigm has changed, where the agent, because of the way the publishers got in the, to in the 90s, where they were getting so much, their slush uh, pile was piling up. Right, yeah. They started using the agents as gatekeepers. So they figured, you know what, if I trace a half a dozen agents, I can trust the, the, the flow that's of, the, of the, the manuscripts that were coming in. And but what that did is it changed the dynamic of what an agent is. Now they're not, they're not representing us. Uh-huh. They're representing the publishing company. Right. And that's a, that changed everything because so now... So what you mean by that is, is the publishing companies are looking for specific titles or works... And then, so that's what you mean by their... Right. Their- so, so if you wrote a, a book and you wanted to get it published by Penguin or Simon & Schuster or whatever, you're probably the best way because you're going to find out on the publishing's website that they're not going to take unsolicited things. It's the same thing with a record company. Mm-hmm. They don't want to get into the legal problem of taking unsolicited things and whatever. So actually, the real reason is it's a, it's a check mark for quality. So mm-hmm. they, if you pass the agent... Mm-hmm. They already assume, okay, it's at least worth my time to read because, you know, there's a lot of writers yeah. out there. Yeah. But the problem with that is now it, made, it forced the writers like us to sell, to pitch the agent. Now, that is an odd situation because mm-hmm. the agent ultimately is a person that's supposed to be representing the, the writer. for you, yeah. Yeah, but that's not – we all know that's not what it is, and the agents have become the agents because they can't change it. It's just the way it is. Okay. I don't really fight – the way things are, yeah. I just don't particularly buy into it, and mm-hmm. now so I'm getting rejections from agents, other than publishing companies. Yeah, that's odd. Ha- yeah. That's just an odd thing. So, bottom line, I just uh, I came across a man named Dean Wesley Smith, uh, great guy. Anybody he's still out there? Uh, he's probably sold six, seven million copies. He's been a ghostwriter. He's written lots of Star Trek novels. That's how I knew him. Uh, but he published independently, and he oh. he put a blog out there of how to do it in the myths of um, traditional publishing versus self-publishing. Yeah. I contacted him. He's he was I, I, he became my mentor, and in thirty days I was published. Wow! I, he he showed me the five things that I needed to do, and how to be a writer, how to be a professional, how to get up in the morning, have the discipline, use best practices that you would have in any business. 
uh, and go at it, and um, I, I, I owe a lot to Dean. Well, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Tell us a little bit more about your, your stories before we move on. Uh, Chris De Niro is a, uh, is a thriller series. It's a counter-terror, counterterrorism uh, thriller series. And it really uh, revolves around the protagonist, Chris De Niro, who is a self-made billionaire. Um, and yes, that can happen. I get a lot of <laughs> things written in there. Say, well, this is great except for the fantasy about somebody who can come from Brooklyn and make a billion dollars. Oh, Actually, no, you can, can do yeah. that in, in the finance world. And so he was a hedge fund manager, and, and but... Uh, my personal story is I lost uh, I lost 14 friends in the uh, World Trade Center, mm-hmm. and uh, kind of out of survivor's guilt, uh, I wanted to make a protagonist that could do what I couldn't do, which is save people from terrorism. Yeah, uh, and that's what writers do. We're storytellers. We right. Can, we so it's kind of like um, I painted my own world where, okay, we we could have a hero that could save people, and so. That's with all of my stories, all the Chris De Niro stories and the Archangel novellas revolve in that universe of Chris has a counterterrorism firm called the Watchman Agency. Uh, he had a road to Damascus moment. Um, it's, not a, it's not a religious context thing, but I do have a Christian worldview to what I write. But it basically what it did is instead of just sticking a gun in his mouth and drinking himself to death after losing his wife, mm-hmm. he decides, hey, I have $6 billion. I'm going to try to help people. I'm, that... Yeah. Is, that changed his life, and then he gets this lackluster counterterrorism firm, changes it to the Watchman Agency, and then I built characters into that universe. Oh, okay. And that's what the stories are about. All right. Where can we learn more about your work? Uh, GerardDemarini.com, that really weird name. Uh, and it, don't worry about spelling it. This is Google Days now. So all you have to do is type in Garage de Mariganis. I'm sure I'm going to pop up. Or type in New Detroit. Or you can go to the, my IMDb page. And then yeah, you can find out yeah. about the movie work. All right. And well, Jen. I'll tell you what, uh, Gerard, you can thank the gentleman sitting right next to you for one thing. I used to just read romance novels, but he has opened my eyes to so many other things. So now I'll read your stuff too, <laughs> simply because uh, he got me reading outside of my comfort and zone. And that person sitting and next to you is. is <laughs> my work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Gregory Compass. And Gregory's latest book, titled Tamburlaine, a Broadway Revival. Uh, Gregory is an adjunct uh, professor for English composition, Nevada State College, Henderson, Nevada. In addition to being a writer and an author, you're also a writing teacher and coach. Uh, Gregory holds a master's in fine arts in creative writing from National University of La Jolla, California, a master of science in education from California State University, East Bay, California, a certificate from... I'm ITC laughing because this is a lot. <laughs> and learning... I'm proud of my most, education. I tell <laughs> you, you should what, be. Uh, not only that, he didn't start as young as some of the others do, in East Bay, California, and Bachelor's of Art in English Literature from Columbia University, New York. You've been right. You have written over 34 pieces, and there are far more accolades than we have time to mention. So I'm going to defer to you to your website. Refer to you to your website, uh, GregoryACompass.com, a learning uh, to learn more, and uh, and to learn more about Tamberlane, who I am madly in love with. Your main <laughs> character. Uh, my daughter is reading this book right now. She is in love with him as well, but we're willing to share. And uh, we had a conversation once before where you were telling me that Chris Marlowe was going to be in maybe yet another book. Well, he's shown up. The book oh, isn't finished cool. yet, so I, I don't know what's going to happen in, in that book yet. But uh, uh, Chris Marlowe is the character you're talking about. He's the lead in Tamburlaine. He's a, an aging drag queen who kept a bar open for a very long time on a promise. And... Uh, I love Tamburlaine. I love that you love Tamburlaine. Oh, I think yeah. that's that's exciting to me. So, um, yeah, and the new the new book, which will be book four or five in this series, I'm not sure where it's going to fit yet. Uh, Chris has shown up, but oh. I don't know. I don't know what his main role is. Well, so. and Jen, you just finished Sky Pirates too. I think I haven't finished it yet. Uh, this is so action packed that I like to reread what I've just read so that I really can visualize even more Mm -hmm. uh it's kind of like i love to read simply because you can rewind 
without rewinding. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about Sky Pirates. Yeah, so Sky Pirates. Um, extraordinary. It, it, thank you very much. Uh, it is an action-packed uh, steampunk novel. Uh, with uh, many gay characters in it. Uh, I write from a gay contemporary standpoint usually, but of course, um, steampunk is uh, Victorian. So Uh Sky Pirates is set in 1851, and uh, Queen Victoria has asked that her main man go looking and finding why the male schooners, the flying male schooners, are being kidnapped and taken. And uh, while he's off doing his thing, his niece and nephew, who are his wards, are coming of age and beautiful bucolic with, uh-huh. with Willow Shire. So uh, it's a chance to write a manor house. I was really, really impressed with Downton Abbey. And uh, so I wanted to write a manor house piece, but I took a steampunk perspective. Uh-huh. So um, ships actually fly and other fun things happen. And uh, it's, a, it's interesting because it's so action packed it's a genre novel and i actually used it as my mfa thesis so it's been very well vetted by the world Uh so kind of made me think back to hg wells type Mm -hmm. yeah hg wells is sort of the center of steampunk right he he was writing the fantastical and speculative fiction um, before anyone else so when you when you want to know what steampunk means think of if Jules Verne were writing today. Right. Um, that that's really you can have any technology you want so long as it's run by steam, or run by technology they had in the era. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun genre to write in, and and it was it was a great fun novel to write. Hopefully, it's book one in a series. There's a second book in that. Oh, very cool. In the process. And you know what I like is that both the authors that are with us today, they weren't they didn't start off being writers. Or authors. Mm, no. Um, and like, I've had a lot of jobs. <laughs> I was a musician for a long time. I toured out of New York City uh, playing musical theater, which is where <laughs> my background comes for writing um, the Broadway series, because all of those books have some connection to Broadway and theater. Uh, and I toured for a long time as a Broadway musician. So, you know, mm. I've also worked in finance, and I've worked in PR, and I've delivered newspapers We're brothers for from years. another mother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just just all kinds of things, and then teaching, of course, as well. Well, and and Jan had mentioned earlier these accolades from you know the degrees that you have that came late later on in life as well. Yeah, well, I dropped out of school the first round um, to be a musician. So did I. <laughs> so wow! I quit high school in junior year. Yeah, yeah. although in my downtime, I didn't write because I had been told in junior high that I would never be a writer, and I believed the teacher. And uh, terrible. But I read. Right. And reading is a great education. And when I was touring and on those buses for all those years, that's where we all started. Right? right. I, you know, yeah. the bargain bins at Barnes and Noble and Borders. You know, <laughs> so um, it was great. It was a great education to yeah. read all of those novels, yeah. um, hundreds of novels over a couple of years. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you know, and that the reason I brought that up is is that we have listeners who are thinking, I can't do this. I don't have a journalistic background. Um, English was my worst subject. Yeah, I know. didn't. I didn't go back till I was in my thirties, and I was working at a bank, yeah. and they offered tuition reimbursement. Oh wow! And we managed to finagle an English degree, most of an English degree, out of that. But I left. Um, I had terrible survivor's guilt too. We lost some friends in nine eleven, and we had to leave the city. I mean, that was that's why we you came know, really. Yeah. So we have that going on too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. don't talk about that very much. It's still very hard for me. Yeah. But yeah. Me, trust me. I, I was talking to a writer over the weekend and trying to help them, and uh, the top came up and tear, the, the tears turned on. And I said, I don't know why this is happening north of 50 years old. But right. It happens. Right. And it's yeah. been so long now. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it doesn't still, go away. It's, it, it doesn't, doesn't go, go away. away. Yeah. Every night I had a car to work. I worked overnights at the bank I worked at. Wow. And the car went right down. I lived in Inwood, which is uh, last stop. 207th Street, last stop on the A train. Right. And the, the car went down the West Side Highway. And so the every night on the way to work, you saw the hole. You were no, just right. reminded, right, that there's the hole in your life. Right. So yeah. that hasn't made it in a novel yet. I haven't been ready to too, write about maybe it. Maybe too tough. I, yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, we're, we're talking about knowing your strengths in writing. And all this kind of plays into it. Absolutely. You know, um, right. So we're going to start off with, um, it, I always go to the internet to try and get inspiration from that or figure out what our, our topic's going to be. And I ran across um, something that was a session by Stephen Manchester, and he's the author of the number one bestseller, 12 Months, Good Night, Brian, and The Rocking Chair. Um, the first step in figuring out your strengths as a writer is to understand what inspires you as a writer. 
And I'd like to find out, we've kind of talked a little bit about what inspires you as a writer. Or, you know, in your case, you were talking about 9-11 inspired you to write your first book. Um, to publish the first book. Well, to publish the first <laughs> book. Uh, so w- the very first thing you wrote, was that the inspiration for it? or uh, The very first thing that I published, because remember, I'm, I was writing always, writing for myself. When I finally got married, I would just hand them to my wife. Okay. We, I, it was no ever any idea that I didn't realize that you could do this independently, which was odd because I owned my own record company, and we had put out independently uh, since the late 70s. Uh-huh. So I knew the independent space on the music side. I just never – well, you had – you remember. You go, you guys have – Oh, yeah. I can than, remember everything. So, Going back to the 1800s almost. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Uh, there you go. So I, I, I was like, you know, it doesn't. It does, I thought just traditional was the only way to get there. And um, that's why I didn't do it, and that's why it's great that you're doing this radio show and telling people that, uh, you know what, actually, I'm – a very big proponent. I speak all over the world, really, on independent. I mean, I don't, I, I don't knock New York. This it's, it's, it's not a knocking thing. It's a legacy. It, to me, I, we, we have a, Barry Eisler came up with the term legacy publishing. Okay. All right. And legacy being a derogatory term, meaning it's the thing of the past. Yeah. All right. B- publishing from New York, um, they controlled it, just like the record companies used to control music. Right. Well, they didn't really monetize correctly on the music side, and these poor musicians that are out there can't earn a living now because it, now it became un- understood for people all over the world to go on the Internet and basically download for free. They have to understand artists have to make a living. We've yeah. got to make a living like a baker or a pizza maker or a candlestick maker. All right? So publishing did it kind of right where – on the independent side, we actually make more money. We earn more money. Right. Royalty and, and yeah. So that was a groovy thing to find out. Mm-hmm. I just had to find out. I didn't, I had to come to it, and Dean Wesley Smith was the first guy, and then there's Joe Conrath and Scott Nicholson. I, I, in 2009, 2010, there was this great emergence of I, what I consider great writers, Stephen England. Um, we were all indie. We all helped each other. We all got on the phone. Uh, Joe Conrath, uh, I'm sure people know there, he sold millions, uh, and Joe is the coolest guy. If you want to read some of the coolest stuff that you're ever going to read on the internet about independent publishing, read J.K. Conrath, uh, because he's a, he's a very, he, first of all, he actually published his earnings. I've never seen that mm. ever by anybody. He actually said, you know what, screw all of this. I'm going to actually show you people how much money I make. Who does that? That yeah. was so helpful to me. You know, for all of us, because we're all sitting there going, well, how many pennies am I going to make? And Well, I, I've seen a, quite a few who have been successful at self-publishing publish what they made. Um, but for the average person going out there and doing this, there's not a lot of money in the beginning. You really have to push the project. Well, unless, well, he, you, unless you've built a big platform for right, yourself. I think right. it all comes down to readership. I mean, it all comes down to readership. Yeah. So if you're going to indie publish, you have to be building your platform. It doesn't mean you have to have your platform today, but you have to always be working on right. finding new readers. You have to be doing things to get your name out there and your work out there. It's the only way you'll be successful as a writer. You know? Yeah. When it I, comes to, I'm I think sorry. Both, I, just, I was just going to say, I think both of you guys understood too that you're you're you're, you're businessmen. When you, yeah. remember, if you're not a writer hat, publishing in New York is writer hat. Right. Independent publishing is publisher hat. Publisher hat means company. That you have to mm-hmm. you have to you have to do it as a business. So that's, 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 that's Absolutely. Really and yeah. and the one thing I say about I love the term legacy publishing to attribute that to to, tra- to traditional. <laughs> I really like that a lot. I may steal that. I will steal that. So <laughs> you heard it here, I'm, Barry. I'm taking that. Uh, uh, but I, I love the idea of that. But I, I always tell students, and I work with a lot of adult learners who are learning how to write and taking the chance for the first time in, in later in life. And I always tell them there's a perfect place for your book. And your book might be great traditionally published. And your book might be perfect for an indie publish. It just depends on the project and what you're willing to do. And, um, and so I think, and what your goals are. Right, you meet lots of writers who want to be published by the big five. But then I say, by all means, if that's your dream, learn how to do it properly, Absolutely. and go after it. You know? I'm not against. I'm not against them. Yeah, yeah. No, all I'm saying that. is, I it's really that. hard to get that contract when you're first starting. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does does independent? I'm going to cut right to the chase. Does independent allow some subpar? writing to get out there. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, you know, if you, it's the same thing the way the music business was. Right. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the guy that's going to be a little different. I'm going to tell you that I like diversity. I like different voices. I like not feeding us all into co- cookie cutters. Uh, the, the people yeah. at this table are not going to write the uh, Transformers 17. I'm not interested. 
Right. I'll do something else. I'll, I'll garden for a living or something. <laughs> right. And, you know, one of the things you guys just brought up is that we're talking about knowing your strengths in writing. Mm -hmm. And because of what you just said, you put on many hats now when you're an, a writer, especially if you're out there self-publishing, because you're not just the writer. You have to think beyond that. And I think one of the things that we talked about on the last show with John D'Amore was the fact that he, he was going to write this novel. He wrote a screenplay. And they said, why don't you put the novel out first, g garner attention to that, and then you know, it'll be easier for us to get the production money to get this off the ground. And then he told the person who made the suggestion, no, I'm going to write this novel, and then I'll just get Random House to buy it, and then, then you know, they're going to sell millions of copies, and then you know, Universal will... <laughs> and so then like a couple years went by, and he ran into this person again, and he's going, you know, John, you really need to just self-publish this. The self-publishing industry is so different today. So just self-publish it, and then you can get the attention you need. No, I'm going to get it. Right. And so he told that story like two or three times, and finally the actor came back to him and said, you know, John, you... <laughs> right. And you know what? It's worked for him, yeah. you yes. know? I mean, in, in, the, in the marketing end of self-publishing, if you can sell 1,000 books, you're doing good. And on the one novel, he, I think he was talking about, he sold over 22,000 copies. So, you know, it's amazing what you can do, and that's what, what we mean by knowing your strength. You know, he, he's a good writer, but he also knew that he had the strength that it takes to get out there and market. Right, but I also think um, no matter how you're published, you have to become a marketer. You have yeah. no choice. Traditional, traditionally published books, you might get a little help for a short period of time, six weeks or something, three months maybe. Then they have new books to market. So you're on your own. I mean, you're totally on your own, more or less on your own, as, as a, a, no matter how you're published when it comes to marketing. So I think knowing your strengths is important, but I think developing strengths in other areas within publishing is important. So developing your skill at self-promotion and talking about yourself and your work and you know, all of those things. Can is I just add something important. though? That I, 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 it's everything totally truth. Sure. That was truth. You guys are saying truth. Uh, um, but I'm going to tell you what Dean Wesley Smith had told me. And it's never changed me, and it totally fit for me anyway. Because I come from rock and roll music where back in the day when musicians sat around and we did what we loved. And if somebody else wanted to walk in the garage or wherever we were playing, that was great. And then I ended up playing 10,000-seat auditoriums. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is you focus on the art. You focus on the right. story. We're yeah, storytellers. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I was talking to Dean about that, and I says, oh, you know, the indie thing, because I'm an entrepreneur. I had my own record company. I, I, I know how to do this thing. Mm -hmm. But... You know, I wanted to understand what should we be doing, and it's everything all the time. Well, your passion has to be there for writing. I mean, that is number one. But he's told me the single best thing that sells your book. And I said, tell me. And he said, the next book. Right, writing the next book. We've talked about that. that. We've talked about important. that so many times on the air. Right. Even with a traditional publisher, they're not going to take you if you don't have something else in, in the works. And sometimes they want you to have two completed. But the main thing is, is that you have to have a passion for writing. I don't care what your strength is in anything else. If you don't have that p passion, then you forget it. Um, you know, you have to be writing because you want to. And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, we've had people on who actually haven't started writing yet but had planned on it. And the thing I tell them is, is don't worry about anything beyond writing the book first. Just write it. Perfect. Then focus on the other because you're going to find that's harder anyway. But the main thing is you have to be writing because you want to. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to learn how to write. Uh, I meet a lot of people who sit down and write a first draft and think they've actually written a book. Mm -hmm. And they haven't. They've written a first draft. Right, right. Now's right. when the real and even work if comes. you finish the first draft, <laughs> right. you're going to yeah. already have a bunch of people that's. And listen, this is this is great. This is fine. You're going to hear that most everybody has a book in them, but. Well, are we all supposed to be painters or are we all supposed to be building right. houses? You're going to find out through the process, through the, through the process of trying to write a book, that you're going to get if – and it, if it happens, just, just accept it and be – that's cool. You know I mean? If you get to chapter two and go, I just can't do this. I didn't know this was going to be work. I thought mm -hmm. this was writing. I get a lot of people that say that to me. Right. Yeah. And I say, hey, listen, it's all love and joy. I mean, when we're when – we're, I'm at my happiest. My wife will tell you mm -hmm. that when I'm writing, and I am at okay. my worst when I'm not. But you finish it. You think it's beautiful. Everybody knows those stories. You read your first draft, and you go, oh, this is beautiful. And then, oh, man, send it to an editor or get it, get it to your, you know, you read it again after letting it cool. You and know? you know what's interesting about what you just said is, is that I have the one book <laughs> that I keep trying to say I'm going to get out there. And I'll have it edited, and I'm not happy with it. And then I'll go back and have it edited again, and I'm still not happy with it. So it, we do reach a point to, like, 
when are you going to be happy with it? Right. Well, you and, know? and I think you also have to learn when to let go. Yeah. I think, it, mm. you know, if you're going to be a professional, if you're going to make a living at this, you have to do the best you can with the project you have in front of you. Give yourself a timeline. And at some point, you have to stop and move on to the next project. I think one of the reasons for that, music is like this too, Absolutely. right? Yeah. I'm just thinking where, the same thing. Where you, you, you're going to be a different musician tomorrow because you wrote this song today. You're going to be a different writer tomorrow because you wrote this book today. Yeah. So at some point you have to let go of that book so you can be the new writer to that move you on become to the next project and yeah. be a better writer for the next book. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I mean, that's I've, knowing your strength and when to stop. Absolutely. And knowing when to move on. <laughs> and move you know? on. And you know what? And the final thing on that too is remember, and I say put on the publisher's hat, think of how a publisher, this, the publisher is the businessman out of this whole thing, all right? So when you're, you're the writer, you want to take all the time in the world to turn out a project. Well, I want to, I, all I care about is the story, and, this is, and that's beautiful. That's where it should be. The publisher is a different guy, all right? So you're going to have to be the different guy. You're going to yeah. have to be the guy to say, hey, listen, I thought you were going to have this book out in June. Right. So I have those conversations with myself because I am that kind of insane guy. I have that insane. <laughs> right. Yeah. It has to be. It has to be. It has to be. You have to have that, that logical guy that's going to say, hey, listen, gee, you promised me this book in June. It's May. I haven't even seen a first draft on this thing yet. Yeah. And that's what separates people from just being a writer to a professional, which means we earn our living from this. Mm -hmm. Is you got, I, I mean, you I have to be disciplined. To, yeah, you have to have the discipline or else you're not going to But I also want to point out here, though, I, I don't want to scare people with, with how disciplined you have to be because oftentimes I hear people who will say this has, and I did this with my first book. I had a date. It had to be out at a certain time. And you can make mistakes if you think it has to be out that day. Right. Because now it's not going to be edited properly. You're not going to have the cover that you should have. And you're not going to have everything set up the way it should be with the printer. So, I mean, or however you're having it printed. So, you know, it is good to have that deadline. But don't freak out if you miss it by a month or so. And I wish you would have talked to me about this. Because, <laughs> you know what? I, I, the, the New Detroit came out three years, I think, and seven months after the, the book five. So what am I saying? You just told me, G, that the publisher puts the deadline. I didn't say that you listen to your publisher. <laughs> well, I'm saying that, of course, you've you got to tell the story the way the story's well, got to be told. You know, today and, is different, too, in publishing. Because it's true what you said, um, Gerard, that today... You're in control of the publishing, the whole air, every aspect of it. And so you can, even though you have a limit or a timeline, you can still delay that if you have to. When I started out, you didn't. When you set your something up with a printer, because they printed for the big houses too. They didn't just print for you. Back then, there wasn't as many people to choose from. So you were on a schedule, and they only had a, a small time frame for the independent publishers to come in and print their books. So I really was on a deadline, and, and I think that really was a mistake for me because the cover wasn't the way I wanted it. The editing wasn't the way I wanted it, but I was forced to get that book in there if I wanted to keep that deadline. Right. That's all changed. I should have pulled that out and said, I'll wait and do it next year, but we always think it has to be done now. Right. But now you don't have that at all. No. You don't have, you don't have that, any of that. No. I mean, almost, you know, if you're publishing through Amazon or CreateSpace, you yeah. have print on demand. Right. You can go in and change it after you've printed it. Oh, yeah. It, and know? that's the great thing we've always right. talked about you is should. you can make the changes. And you yeah. should. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, absolutely. There, uh, uh, th 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 on that aspect, where we were talking about what you were talking about before, about constantly changing the manuscript before you put it out and this and that, and I'm not a big proponent on that, neither is Dean. I, I, I like the Pulp Fiction guys. You, you write it, you edit it, you put it out. Let's move on. I got a lot of other stories in my head before I want to go yeah, on the ground. Yeah, yeah. But I will say this. Like, for instance, when you move into the film and you move into TV work, there's absolutely deadlines. So either you can do it or you can't well, do it. Maybe it's true. not right for yeah. you. So, yeah. And I, when I talk to Dean, I ask him very specific questions because I've been poor and I've been rich, and rich is a lot better. All right? <laughs> uh, and, I, you know, I, I didn't want to live in a park again. Okay? Yeah. So I, I said, how many of these novels do I have to put out? in order to make an earn. And he goes, well, gee, let's put it this way. And he says, and I don't want to push you off, just like what Jim, James was saying, you know, I don't want to put off people. But he was saying, listen, let's say your book is not going to be the biggest hit in the world. You're going to have to write four novels. A he says, try to get between two and four novels, full-length novels a year, and do it for about 10 years. And I was glad that he told. This was a personal conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, Dean, I hope you don't mind that I'm sharing the <laughs> personal side. But... Um, I was like, oh, my, <laughs> had a heart. It only took me 47 years to get out the first one. So <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, so 47 times four, I, yeah. I got to live about 790,000 years before I'm going to actually make enough money to, to buy milk and bread. And uh, how are you going to tell your wife that? 
But you know what? He was right. It was a good. It is. I still use that same number. Do I do it every? Year? No, I don't. Uh, but I've gotten lots of other projects, and and I'm working on 15 projects right well, so now. So one thing leads to the other. Yeah, and that's why I say now we go back. It's a circular conversation where we go back. What's the most important thing? The story. We all tell story. Tell the best story, story. and mm -hmm. guess what? It can light up. I yeah. my first book put out uh, between uh, January 21st, 2000, and when did that book come out? 2011, uh, to September 10th, all right? So 10 months, I sold 47 copies. Uh -huh. There you go. Yep. I was already, I published my second book by that time, and I was writing my third book. Mm -hmm. And on September 11th, I woke up, I was a bestseller in eight countries, and I was selling 8,400 bu books an hour. Wow. So, so all I'm saying, guys, is that's not brilliant me. That's not marketing me. I know everybody, and I don't knock any of this. It's great. You could do the marketing. I, I tried all different things. I sold 47 books. Google and 9-11, and my book had something to do with 9-11, made people go to the page. And I guess by the time I woke up, people were interested in enough in buying right. the piece. That yes. is an important thing to do. Find a niche. Find something. Because that happened with, with, with Lance Talbot, too. You know, oh. he, he wrote a book called Ripper. He happened to put it out at the 100-year anniversary of Jack the oh, Ripper Jack or whatever. Yep. And it did well, quite well. And it's because people were associated with Ripper. So even though it was a different type story, but, you know, it was still the Ripper, but different. But anyway, the thing is, is that that is, that's true. That's amazing how that happened. It's but. amazing, and, but also understand, you know, Ripper uh, and, and with the 9-11, um, I would love to tell you that I was brilliant and I figured that out beforehand. I <laughs> did not. I was trying to tell a story. We have that in common. I was dealing with survivor's guilt, and I was happy with the 47. And that's what Dean taught me. Dean was saying, gee. Right. Don't worry about the things that you can control. And we try to – we're, now we're, this is a discussion about discoverability, and everybody has their own ideas, and great. I'm not really good at it. I mean, I was a professional musician. The way I became discovered is I went on – I played 300 dates a year for 10 years and didn't have a home. So, I mean, I, I'm not going back there. So right. I put the books out. I try my best on social media, but I get to that next book, and that's really been the secret of my, six, my yeah. personal – Success. So you know your strengths. <laughs> that's my, right. that's yeah. my strength. All right. We're going to read on a little bit further here. To discover your true inspiration, your muse, ask yourself two simple questions. What do I really want to write about? And that's interesting because you write in, in different genres, really. I, I do. I, yeah. I break the rule. I cross over genres yeah. because I write what I want to write. So do I. I tell the stories I want okay. to tell. Oh, yeah. And I, I have characters show up, and they're like, write me a book. Well, Grizzly Adams story. is certainly different than, oh, you know, totally. your other novels. Oh, I love Black Eyes, the so. first round of Grizzly Adams. I can't wait to I see know. this. I know. Oh, it's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woof. <laughs> 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 and if you were writing only for myself, if I were writing only for myself, what would I write? And that's an interesting thing, too. Like, I think really that's how I started out writing. Um, well, it, it was. I, I actually started out writing before I ever the first novel that came out is not the first thing I ever wrote. The first thing I ever wrote, golly, was in, uh, a, as a kid a, in, in junior high, a friend of mine and I decided we wanted to write and uh, create our own newspaper about all the monsters out there, the werewolves, the Draculas and stuff, and we made them comical characters. And we actually wrote it, created the characters, you know, did the illustrations, and then we would go door to door and put them on people's doors. <laughs> That's the first thing. That's great. But my first r real work that anyone ever took seriously was something that I, I w I've told this on the air as well. I was watching. We were out of work in here in Las Vegas at the time, back in 1980. Now I'm dating myself for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this friend I was living with, she watched General Hospital. I should have probably said that, but anyway, I actually said. I can write as good as this. <laughs> and we actually created a piece that actually a Hollywood producer was interested in back then. Um, so it is interesting because I wrote for myself. We didn't write that for anybody. I just wrote that as a hobby because we were out of work for three months. And it just, you know, I would have to say it encouraged me. Nothing became of it. But it did encourage me to continue with my writing. And then it was in 1995 that I really took my writing seriously from something that's really kind of serious. Well, the one thing that everybody's got to understand, too, that writes their very first book, you probably won't become a millionaire with this first book. No. 
but if it inspires you, keep writing because the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one might be the one that does the trick. Well, and we know someone who, who, who did exactly what we're talking about, and that was Don Lewis Barnhart. Don, who was in Hollywood 40 years, you know, he had a great, a successful career in Hollywood, but he, when he became a novelist, he wrote four novels. And Good, I knew, give them away. No. He, he, in fact, when he was on our radio show for the very first time, he had only wrote, sold seven novels. Seven out of the four. Seven copies. Seven copies okay. out of the four. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, and then when he did his first book signing at Barnes & Nobles, he did okay. But the thing is, is that, you know, don't give up either. That's the other thing. Right. Is, don't give up. But he did write because he really wanted to. I mean, I don't think in his mind, of course, he had a successful career as a director. So in his mind, as long as he was writing what he wanted to write, and Jan, you've read, I think, uh, one yeah. or two of his books. Yes. So that's all he cared about was that he was more or less writing for himself. It's kind of like what you were talking about, you know, G, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that he was writing for himself. Um, and understand, once you finish that first book, you are a success because you have completed You completed it. that first book, exactly. Very important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Completing it. All right, so once you have the answers as to what, what your inspiration is, and then you want to talk about what, do really, what, what you really do want to write about. We talked about that. Um, how comfortable and skilled am I with this sort of writing? And that's an interesting thing, because if you write in different genres, how do you gauge that? I mean, well, I write all over the place. Well, I think, I mean, you become a writer and you write. And you tell yeah. a good story. And if there are conventions, if you're writing a romance, then you have to follow the conventions of romance, right? You have to arrive at a happily ever after. Otherwise, it's, it upsets the romance readers if mm -hmm. we don't arrive there. Uh, if you're writing speculative fiction, you have to become really good at world building. In the end, it's still human relationships in that, exp in, in that environment. So mm -hmm. I, I think we, we grow comfortable by reading in the genre. We grow comfortable by writing in the genre. And the more you do it, the better you become. I mean, I, for most of us, I think that's how that works. So I don't think it's, um, I can't do this because I don't do this. It's, uh, right. I want to do this, so now I have to figure out how to do this. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing to, to, to keep in mind, too, in the, in the literary world, in, with the big traditional publisher, publishers, if you were a romance author, they basically wanted you to stay in that genre. Right. If, you, if you wrote science fiction, they wanted you to stay within that genre. In the self-publishing industry today... You don't ha you're not stuck in one little niche of, of writing. You can go anywhere you want to go. Right. Um, but you still, the, the hard part, and I've run into this, is people who love Tambor Lane don't like the Sky Pirates book. Okay. Because it's a different genre, yeah. and a lot of them won't cross over. Do you know? The, they are niche right. readers, and they don't cross over. So in the process of writing across genres, then you have to build audiences in those different genres. But you can do that, But though. you can absolutely do that. I'm not saying you can't, yeah. but... Uh, That's where ghost names come into play. In, uh, and names, yeah. Uh, you know, authors have... Uh, in, in the old standard, you, what you do is you come up... Because, uh, 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 again, going back to Dean, uh, he had come up with a lot of ghost names so that he could write out of the genre. That, that was the rule. In yeah. other words, like what you're saying yeah. was correct. Uh, the only thing I would say that it doesn't apply to is when you go in, and you're writing into Hollywood, because um, when the now you know on the novel side we have control over what we want to write and you, you're writing what you want. But I'm a professional writer, so I do you know when you if, right. you, th if you look at us as well, if I wanted to hire you guys to write a country western or western moot thing, something that's out of your ballpark, yeah, will you write it? Now some people won't. I particularly love it. I particularly love, you know, the, for you, you use Grizzly Adams. Uh, when, when Mike called me up with the Grizzly Adams idea, they had worked on it. Todd, Todd uh, worked for Cellier, the guy that came up with Grizzly Adams. Uh, and um, so they, they knew this whole space really well. I was a kid that watched Grizzly Adams on television and saw the movie. That's all I right, knew. I'm right. a kid from Brooklyn. What do I know about Grizzly Adams? And, and uh, so when Mike called me up, and this happens with all of my projects, the first question is, do you want to do it? And before he, he laughs because he says, gee, he's worked with everybody. He's worked with Dial. He's worked with Burmese. He's, he's worked with the guys that created Star Trek. And he, he, Mike Greenberg, just for people to know, uh, is the creator of MacGyver and Stargate, SG-1. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you know, me too. Uh, you know, among other things. So he, he's worked with 400 of the best writers in Hollywood. 
uh, I'm not a writer in Hollywood. So when he, he, was, he read my novel, loved the novel so much that we're going to turn this into a movie. That's how I met the Mike. Mike, call, Mike was a phone call. So that's, one, that's another important thing for people to understand. Okay, so you're 47 books or you're 7 books or you're 7,000 books, whatever it is. It's, you don't be surprised if you stay at it and you wrote a really good piece that somebody out there is going to, to notice, notice it. it and just give you a call. I got a call from James Kelly. I, I, oh, I didn't get a call. I got a, what, an email. An excuse email. me. <laughs> And uh, it was, hey, do you want to come on my show? Uh, you know, it ends up that we, like, live next door to each other. We show you how Las Vegas is. We <laughs> and all know, live, like, next know door the to same each people. Other. Yeah, we know the same people, but, like, you know, I don't believe. But uh, my, my point is when you get a call from Hollywood, it's more or less out of you. You don't have control. I worked on the, the Dorothea Lang piece. I didn't even know who Dorothea Lang is. That's how dumb I am. And, uh, you know, she's the lady that... Uh, this really is the founder of the modern documentary. And then Black Ice, we, none of us, I sure I know, sure I never that. heard of that. And so are you going to do it? I, my, na- my hand's always raised. That, I think that's something that when you're poor, yes, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll, and, and he But it should like, be that way all the time. Writers should be fr- afraid. Actors yeah. should be afraid. Artists should be afraid. If you're not afraid of your art, then you're letting it go complacent. You're letting it go. You should be a little afraid. If I hit you guys with, I'm sure if I hit everybody at this table with a topic that you don't feel very comfortable with, we're going to write about Africa in 1850s. Mm-hmm. That's, how, that's how TV and Hollywood work, by the way. So I, does that, if you're a writer You have heart, to adapt is what you're well, saying. Well, my, my, yeah. my thing is if you have a writer heart, you're going to smile. You're going to go, yeah. holy moly, I don't know a I come to these projects the with challenge. zero. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Right. And that's oh, all I'm yeah, my first thought was, oh, cool, it's an opportunity to do more research. And, and he does <laughs> think that way too, yes. because he talks about every time they come out with something new in self-publishing, he he writes a book just so he can try that out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. So it's so true. It's so true. That's what we are all, and you, everybody knows. We are all writers. Are all, in essence, readers. So. We discover things through our reading, and it, the process of writing should be a journey for the writer. So we, we understand that stuff. And what I love, the last thing, too, on this is if you get four of us to write on the same topic, guess what? You get four different p- points yeah. of view. Absolutely. That is, that's, television works that way. You have writer's rooms. We bring ten writers in there, and guess what? All we do is fight and bicker and laugh, and, and, have, and it's just all about, hey, wow, we all came up with so many different beautiful ideas yeah, on the yeah. same topic. Yeah. 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 So you, you, it is, it's important to know that you, that's an important strength to know that you have that ability. I mean, that's very important. Um, one of the things they talk about, uh, and you, I'm sure Greg's going to talk about this a little bit, is one of the strengths is reading. Well, I um, think I've already said it three times this morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, I think if you want to be a good writer, you have to read. And yeah. if you want to be a really good writer, you have to read across genre. Um, if you just read the genre you write in, you're so limiting yourself to vocabulary and style and possibility. But when you read across genre, you get to hear all these different voices and all these different styles, mm-hmm. and you get to go to worlds you've never gone before because it isn't where you spend a lot of your time. And then the process, you become informed. I've always said that probably the best education you can get ever is traveling. And I know both of you have traveled. But in a way, even if you can't afford to travel, to go all over the world or wherever, you can read. And that's your escape. That's, it's the same thing. So it's kind of like one of the best educations there is out there is because you can escape into a different world. And I think that's what brings us together as a world is understanding each other in, in different aspects of life. And you can't do that by sitting at home, stuck to one TV program, and, 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 and you, you have tunnel vision, and that's all you see. Or you can't do that by not going out and exploring the world and see what's going on. You know, you really have to, in order to find that strength, you've got to get out there and do something. It's so funny that you said that because you just hit me right directly in the heart. If you really want to know, the first book I ever read was back to Jack London. So what would it be a kid on DeKalb Avenue in, in Bethard-Stuyvesant in Ridgewood, Queens, what did I know about Alaska? Nothing. And what it did is it took that kid that was living in a railroad apartment and it brought me to a beautiful, unbelievable universe. Mm-hmm. And it was Jack London that did that through Wai Fang. That was okay, the first yeah. book that I, I, I ever, novel that I ever read. And, that, so you're, you know, and you're so right. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I don't read in my genre. So I'm going to let it right out there. I was a voracious reader in my genre before I became a professional. Mm-hmm. But because of the, our, our tendency to glean too much, 
I don't ever want to get into a case that I read the new Griffith. I, I've taken a lot from W.B. Griffith, but he writes historical, so I'm not really an historical novelist. But um, like Clancy and, and some of the great guys, the Connollys and the Mills, I actually don't read anything so that nobody comes back to me because I get it a lot. I get, hey, gee, you know, your book is just like the Oregon Files that uh, Cussler put out in three. Well, I can say I have never read it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have to read out of my genre. I continually read out of my genre. And that's interesting because I, my first novel that was published was I, I don't read government espionage. And that's what I wrote. So it is interesting how – I think a lot of times we, we learn from osmosis. We learn from all the things that go in and, and on and around us, and we don't even realize what we're uh, absorbing. And I do know that this, the second novel that I had published, it actually came from a documentary. The whole premise of that book came from a, a simple little documentary on the depletion of the rainforest, and it's a science fiction novel. So, you know, I think realizing those strengths and, and paying attention to what you you're see and what you're doing is really a great ability to have. You know, you have to know how to incorporate that into everything you're doing. Yeah, but, hmm. yes, but I also, I, I think just having experience, just having experience is how you become a better writer, too. I Even if you can't travel the world. Right. Right. But... I do it. I do this thing called Friday field trips. I take a Friday field trip every week. Fridays okay. are like sacred to me. I don't book work unless it's something really important, and I go somewhere here. I mean, within a half day's drive, right? Because it's just a day trip. Um, I've been exploring the desert and rock art and the little museums that are within a day's drive of Vegas and all the southern escarpment and Utah and you know all of that stuff inspires me to right. to write so and along the way I'm on the drive I'm usually listening to an audible book so um so, so even then there's still fiction being included but I think it so you start layering all of these life experiences right. together and then odd interesting cool combinations come out the what if questions get answered through our writing. Right. Do you know what I mean? I, well, so it's kind of like we are saying the same pieces. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it absolutely. is learning from life's experiences. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and, and I would just say this too. Writing is what we do. Storytelling is who we are. Yeah. So what, what ha- the, the, you remember, writing is a craft and it's a profession. Um, we're storytellers. And, and that's why I've never had the problem of making the jump. People I get asked a lot too, you know, how did you get into the, into the script, into the script writing and this and that? I didn't. I, I got a phone call. I, I, I'm very blessed to have Mike uh, uh, give me a call and, and be so devoted to my writing and stuff like that. But to me, it's just another place to tell my story. Yeah. And so it's a different writing. It's a different type of writing. Script writing is, is vastly different than writing novel or, or you know, anything else. But I, that's, that's, again, that's going to craft. We go to the desert, you and I. He comes back. Let's all four of us go to the desert and, and go walk around and have a little exercise. And guess what? You're going to tell a different story. You're going to tell a different story. It's just like expressionist. Remember Picasso? You, Picasso and Rembrandt could look at the same box of tissues that I'm looking at right now. And they're I'm looking at a box of tissues. Yeah. And, and the box of tissues, uh, Leonardo da Vinci is going to do it exact. And you're going to say, oh, wow, that's the beauty is in the exactness. And Picasso is going to do something that looks like a mushroom or something. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to go, wow, that's so cool. It's just it, So that's the beauty in that, the diversity in. In, in, in well, and it's the same premise as when someone tells a story. I'll tell you the story in your ear. You're going to tell it to, you know, Greg, and then Greg's going to tell it to Jan. And then when she tells it to me, it's going to be a different story that I, from what I told you. Especially because we're all liars. <laughs> Storytellers are, <laughs> not, I should but, say, you know, fiction guys are that's, all liars. That's the right. embellish it a little bit. <laughs> unreliable <laughs> narrators, not liars. <laughs> oh, yeah. But that's the wonderful thing about writing is that we do have a different perspective on life. And if, if we all saw things the same way, it would be boring. Right. Yeah. You know? Randall, yeah, exactly. Randall Platt, the author Randall Platt, she's a great YA author, and she's been a big supporter of the Las Vegas Writers Conference, so she's been here many times teaches a class sometimes where she has everyone in the room write one of the fairy tales like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, yeah. and then you have everybody read it. And everyone's version, even though we all grew up on that story, everyone's version is different. Their voice is different. Their style is different. The perspective of the characters is different. It's just different. Yeah. You know, we did an exercise once on the air about four years ago, and where someone, I, you know, I said, give me... Give me an, 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 an object. object. And so they, this, 
the um, author that was on the show said, how about a toothbrush? Yeah. And from there, I started to lead in about this wasn't just a toothbrush. This toothbrush had fallen behind into a, a crack in, in, in the wall, you know, between the um, trim. And then when they remodeled the house, it got trimmed over. And then they sold the house, and then a couple moved in. Anyway, and we kept building on it, and we allowed other people on the show to add to it as well. And it became like a murder type thing to where they solved the murder because that toothbrush had blood on it <laughs> and when they found it someone said there's something wrong here and then they found went and did a newspaper thing and i mean it's yes. amazing how when you we you can actually create things together mm -hmm. that quickly we did that on the air in about five minutes yeah a collaboration um, yeah yeah we yeah. continually do it as a great uh, producer in town uh phil nobert and phil and i have been going back years and years we we agree on absolutely nothing he's a boston red sox fan i'm a yankee fan we're never going to get that <laughs> done that we're never going to agree on that but what we do is exactly what you're saying and it's very good for writers to do that by the way uh, yeah. for creators storytellers yeah. is he'll throw some, he'll throw text at me and, and it, all it is is context of something so you know i i walked into uh, the dentist office today and i saw this guy dot 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 and mm -hmm. so after that ellipsis, you start filling in. And you know what? That's the, that's the essence of what we do. Storytellers, writers, we fill in th that dot. So premise, yeah, right. tell me about it. I teach a, um, a fiction series under an NEA NAC grant for one of the local libraries. And it's called Fiction Through Prompts. And it's what we do uh, every other week, the first and uh, third Tuesdays. We, I take them in a prompt, usually a high-end prompt, but a prompt, and they have to write to the prompt. They don't know what it's, it's going to be in advance, and then everybody shares, and we give feedback and critique to each other. And it's such a great learning oh. tool, this idea of, of uh, well, I have to tell you tossing guys, you in. I would love to continue with this, but we are <laughs> literally running out of time again. I, I, it's amazing how fast this show goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Gerard, where can we learn more about your work? On my website, uh, uh, GerardDemarini.com, and on IMDb. And Greg? Uh, Gregory A. Compass, that's K-O-M-P-E-S.com. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank our guests, uh, Gerard Demarini and Gregory A. Compass. Did I get it right? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> right. Along with my, I took the whole show, but anyway, along with my co-host, Janet Corsi, um, you can find the video of the show on YouTube.com. Just go to YouTube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing or look under James Kelly. And uh, let's see, you can also go to our website. We have links on our website to everything, by the way. You know, iHeartRadio, um, YouTube, uh, there's like a dozen things there. And we have, we're on like 14 terrestrial stations. So just go to aspectsofwriting.com, and you can find links to everything. And if you're interested in our author's books, you, there's a link there to their books as well. Um, in addition, we archive our shows on aspectsofwriting.com. So you can go back and listen to past episodes. So until next week, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, everyone, for being on the show. Thanks, James. You're welcome. Thank you.